Morals and Man, Part 5 Another fact should be included here. Man is a social animal. His beatitude, whatever it may be, is at any rate not a solitary satisfaction. Human nature is social. Its end, therefore, must be social. And this means that not only the individual's perfection, but that of others also must motivate his actions. That excellent 18th century Dominican, Father Worthington, was being a true Thomist when he left as a legacy to his brethren an infallible cure for worms, just as he was being a true Thomist when, one imagines, he himself reaped the benefits of his ingenuity. Altruism is included. The social life is an element of, in the end. It is also an element in the means. It is not merely the altruism, which in fact is a sort of subliminated egoism, prompted simply by the fact that, well, without well-doing, there can be no real well-being. It must be altruist in motive, too, springing from real benevolentia, a question not of impersonal, though beneficent, organization, but of a personal contact with and affection for individuals. The need for a scale of values regulating these various elements in the perfection of the personality is evident. There is naturally in man a desire for the perfection of body, heart, mind, for the good of others, for God. How are these tendencies to be coordinated? Clearly God, to whom principally we ought to be bound, must come first, and what will separate us from him must be foregone however much it may seem to be for the advancement of some other tendency. Secondly, benevolence and self-love, to use Butler's terms, must be set in their right relation to each other. The love of self, as experience would seem to show, is normally deeper and stronger than the altruistic impulse, and this is borne out by the divine command that we should love our neighbor as ourselves. Self-love being thus the criterion. For the regulative, as St. Thomas remarks, is prior to the regulated. True, commandments are one thing, counsels of perfection another. We can choose between do well, do better, do best. To save another by the sacrifice of one's own life is best, but if we are considering merely what is ethically right, do well, then charity can truly be said to begin at home. But again, there is hierarchy in the makeup of man. Matter is clearly subordinate to spirit, and another's material gain cannot justify one's own spiritual loss. I may not do wrong in order to help another. There may be occasions when it is the duty of the individual to give up his life either for the common good or for an individual if the latter is in extreme spiritual danger. It is always his duty, according to St. Thomas, to suffer bodily damage for his friend, but it can never be licit to incur spiritual damage for another. Again, some have greater claims upon our love and help than others. The nearer to us, the greater the claim. And in any case of conflict of duty, when one is faced with rival claims, it is this principle of greater nearness which must decide. Further, the principle of the primacy of the spiritual gives the clue to the way towards the perfection of the personality. I may not do wrong for the sake of some bodily or intellectual good. I may not put bodily perfection before the perfection of mind and heart. But body and sense knowledge are to be perfected precisely as subordinate and subservient to mind and contemplation, while both elements together are to be brought to actualization in subservience to the supreme claims of God as an object of knowledge worship, and love. Object of love, 
There must be, as we have seen, disinterested service, since otherwise there could not be love, which, as St. Bernard of Clairvaux said, seeks no other cause or end but itself. But disinterestedness means doing the right because it is the right, not because it is desirable. Caritas non quaerit bonum delectum propter delectiano nem. Charity does not seek the loved good for the sake of the pleasure to be derived from it. And her eudaimonism finally comes one with deontology. This synthesis is, it would seem, what Butler was trying to establish in his discussion of duty and interest, as indeed, in a more limited range, were Cudworth and Clark in making the Occamnist legalism rational, and Cumberland in identifying God's will with altruism. Professor Broad regards Butler's coordination of conscience with self-love as simply an inconsistency and his assertion that cool reflection can justify no course of action contrary to happiness as a hypothetical concession in the course of argument. But it might well be argued that in this, on the contrary, lies the whole value of Butler's inquiry. He held that benevolence and conscience may cause conflict, and there Perhaps he did not sufficiently clarify the meaning of benevolence by distinguishing what we might call short-term charitable activity from long-term benevolentia. But his assertion that at least happiness and conscience cannot conflict bring him very close indeed to the Thomist view. If it can be allowed, as has already been urged, that by happiness he meant what St. Thomas calls objective beatitude. The end, not merely enjoyment apart from any thought of end. It is this distinction which justifies the truth in eudaimonism and makes it capable of inclusion in the Thomist scheme. To seek one's own happiness in the sense of pleasure or self-gratification without thought of natural purpose, is inadmissible. First, because of the difficulty of saying exactly in what such ultimate pleasure would consist, the attainment of each desired enjoyment leads ultimately to a realization that it has not made its possessor fully happy. Secondly, because it is merely selfish. But to seek one's own happiness in the sense of one's own objective beatitude is very different. It means seeking the true end of one's capacities, one's perfection, and the joy consequent on this. From the attainment of the end, pleasure will in fact flow because it is the activity most proper to the agent. But it is not opposed to altruism since, in fact, altruism demands it as prerequisite condition that the agent shall be in a position to help others, that is, he shall be himself perfect. A thing, says St. Thomas, must be perfect in itself before it can cause other things. Subjective beatitude alone is no criterion. Objective beatitude is. To ask oneself merely, Will a career as a film star make me happy? That is, be pleasant? Is an inadequate question, for you cannot tell. To ask, will it make me happy? That is, fulfill the somewhat of possibility in me. And so, in consequence, be enjoyable, is a sound and sufficient question. If you are justified in asking whether this or that action is making for your own object beatitude, since in so doing you are eo ipso asking if it is right. Further, since God is absolute truth, the right is objectively and universally right. 
and Kant's universalize, universalizability maxim as a criterion of the right is justified. The mind's object is universal and absolute. It follows that the object of the will is universal and absolute, too. The right is law. But it follows from this again that human nature is its own law, since its right is its own completion. The Ten Commandments, for St. Thomas, are precepts of natural reason. In that sense, reason is autonomous, but we add that reason is the norm only because God, who works in th all things according to their nature, so contrived the nature of man as to ordain his reason to know absolute truth, truth greater than himself, before which he must bow, reality being the measure of the mind, not mind the fabricator of reality. Next, there must be the doing of God's will as such, that is, because it is God's will. Disinterestedness in terms of religion and room is made for the scheme for this element on the theory of Occam and his followers. It may perhaps be agreed, then, that various essential elements of a adequate ethic are to be found in the Thomist theory. It remains to try to show that they are not merely collected together, but really synthesized. And there is one other preliminary point. The utilitarian doctrine denies that motives have any place in the ethical judgment. On the other hand, there is the theory that motives are the only thing that counts, and that one ought to act without regard to consequences. Here again, St. Thomas includes both things. Bonum ex integra causa, malum ex quocumque defectu. You have to consider the end of the action, the end of the agent, and the circumstances. If there is anything wrong with any of these, the action is wrong. Let us now try to draw the various strands together. Starting from the divine activity, we may say, 1. God created man with a nature, the end of which is its own perfection. 2. That perfection consists primarily in the knowledge, love, and worship of God, in a perfected personality, in company with one's fellow men. 3. Because it is man's duty to seek his end, because on the other hand God in his entelechy and his happiness, it is his duty to seek his own entelechy, eudaimonism, and his own happiness. And even, though not exclusively for its own sake, his own pleasure, hedonism, since pleasure is attendant upon congruous activity, since he may not seek a greater good for the sake of a lesser, for then they would be seeking his last end as a means of some other end, and therefore not his last end at all, he ought not to seek God, objective beatitude, merely for the sake of his enjoyment of God, subjective beatitude. In acting for God's sake primarily, man is eo ipso acting for his own sake. The duty for duty's sake, deontology, becomes eudaimonist, and not duty for duty's sake merely, but for God's sake in the sense, for the love of God. You serve what you love because you want to, and indeed because you have to. Coget me stimulus amoris. Thus do disinterestedness, deontology, even a sort of analogical determinism become one with eudemism. Bonum ex integra causa. Every right action must not be in opposition to the norms of conduct. An action which is opposed to altruism cannot be defended on the score of eudaimonism. Eudemon 
An action which is the good of the agent and the society cannot be defended if deontology condemns it. If it is in consonant with the absolute right. 6. But these values have their hierarchy, and here the conflict of duties can, can be decided. The highest value has the greatest claim. This scale is carefully worked out by St. Thomas. The love of God is being set above all that other things, the lower rivalries between self and others, and among the others, and within the self, are rationally decided. 7. Lastly, neither motive nor consequences can be neglected. The action itself, the motive, the circumstances, must all be right if the action is to be right. Thus the standard of the objectively right action is composed. But this objective pattern is yet remote from morality strictly as such, from the good. It must become subjectivized in willed action by the human agent before it becomes moral. When the honest shopkeeper hands me the right change across the counter, he is doing a moral action. When the machine in Piccadilly Tube Station gives me my right change, it is not. The event, the giving of just change, is the same. The character of the event is different. So it is the law that is, strictly speaking, irrelevant to morality until it becomes subjectivized, assimilated by the agent, and the pattern of right action, as defined by law, is produced ab intrinsico as an expression of the agent's mind and will. This is the ultimate test of morality between the external legislation and conscience. For an action consonant with law, yet contrary to the conscience of the agent, is bad, while an action contrary to law, but consonant with the conscience of the agent, is good. And as goodness is that which gives value to the act, so it is only in far as the objective norms have become part of the personality and thus characteristic actions as determined ab intrinseco that they have moral significance. It is to the achievement of this coincidence of object and subjective in all things that the fight towards legalist absorption in the external an effort towards growth of the spirit in perfection, are directed. So, for the spiritual man becomes assimilated into the autonomy of the person, and the idea of imposition without necessarily passes into that of free and creative determination by the agent. Thus the perfect action is that which, wholly determined ab intrinsico, is the same time wholly consonant with the objective pattern which law, reason, and in the last resort, God, establish. The philosophical synthesis is thus complete. How can one fail, asked Lytton Strachey, to miss a great deal if one consists in considering the world from one another side of the House of Commons? We have reached a scheme of things in which every side is viewed. But would it work in practice? The knowledge of God possible to reason alone is so meager that, since love depends on knowledge, the God motive would, be, would in practice, in the majority of cases, be either non-existent or at least very weak. Almost certainly the synthesis would split up in St. Thomas's completed scheme, when he speaks as a theologian, this danger is absent. Beatitude is revealed and clearly defined as possible of atta attainment, the aggregate of all good things, the possession of God, revelation opens us to the mind of God, and faith in the gifts of the Holy Spirit help us to see things as he sees them.
omni quasi oculo di intumur. By faith, we see all things as with the eyes of God. Again, since we are made partakers of the divine nature, the love of God becomes a possible intimate relationship, the consortium de. The struggle which the theologian describes in terms of grace and original sin are far from being an outmoded fiction. Its reality is all too clear to us from our own experience, our knowledge of good and evil and consequent misery which weigh down the world, as well as from the evidence of psychology, which describes something of the same conflict in terms of conscious volition and instinctive or unconscious drives. These drives and instincts are not to be destroyed and a new layer of supernatural desires planted in their stead. Chaotic themselves, and potentially either good or evil, they are to be directed this way rather than that, to God and not to evil. But this again means not that they must be wrenched from the pursuit of self-fulfillment, but that the nature of the fulfillment must be truly defined. We are not creatures of instinct in the sense that instincts will lead us where we ought to go. That is the difficulty. And the right direction of primitive instincts is a difficult business. To take it as most obvious, it is far from, self, far from sufficient to herd people into church. On the contrary, if, if once there they are presented with vapid statues and vapid sermons and are made to sing mindless yearnings to flee from this wicked world and rest in a somewhat negative but superlatively comfortable deity, their instincts are in fact being set precisely in the wrong direction. They are being suggested into subhumanity instead of help towards divinity. Grace is not magic. It does not work independently of nature, but builds upon it. It has, therefore, to make the best, so to say, of the material it finds. And if that material has been rendered unmalleable, its effectivity is reduced. Growth in supernatural life is of course, determined by the brilliance of mental powers, for supernatural wisdom is of the kind which overrides discursive reasoning and is, in the phrase of pseudo Dennis, a pati divina, the experimental awareness which come of sympathy or connaturality with divine things. But where there is not merely negation but privation, rather where an attitude of mind is being positively acquired which is contrary to the growth which grace should promote, strengthen, and elevate, then the work of grace is hindered. By the grace of baptism, the soul is energized with those habitual dispositions of good action which we call supernatural virtues, but the effectivity of these is, is dependent on effort, and they will remain dormant or decay if that effort is lacking. It is possible to receive the sacraments with great frequency and emotional piety, but to gain relatively little benefit from them because of this lack. Similarly, with regard to growth of the personality in general, Grace here, as elsewhere, perfects nature, presupposes nature, and cannot make good a privation of natural means. And the point to be immediately emphasized is that this growth is an inner process, a movement from within. It cannot be imposed by violence from without. You cannot dragoon a man into holiness, you will either make him rebel, or you will reduce him to a level of subhumanity at which holiness in any real sense is impossible. We are told in the portrait of the artist of how the daily light of Stephen Daedalus was laid out in devotional areas, 
how he strove by constant mortification to undo the sinful past rather than to achieve a saintliness fraught with parallel. And what was then surprised to find that at the end of his course of intricate piety and self-restraint, he was so easily at the mercy of childish and unworthy perfections. It was in fact hardly surprising. Only a moron could continue unperturbed in an intensive program of qualitative piety, not prompted by love, and negative rather than positive. The process of divinization is radically the growth of love, and love has no liking for cash registers. It cannot be forced. James cannot be made to fall in love with Clarissa, on the other hand, once in love, he will rightly deny, for all that he has become determinist, that his actions are forced. It is determinism from within, not from without. It is the same with the impulse of the Spirit of God, disposing all things sweetly. The wisdom and understanding which he gives, and the fruits of his indwelling which St. Paul enumerates, are habits of the soul, but they are dispositions primarily of passivity, of being acted upon rather than of acting. It is not expedient, says Aristotle, to take counsel of human reason where divine instincts are given. But though they thus denote obedience to a higher power, it is an obedience, willed and demanded, to a spirit who draws only by the inspiration of love. Amore ipso spir spiritivo et ponderosa quadam inclinatione. Di estis, I said, ye are gods. Divinization is the end to which the theology can point. It will not be irrelevant here to remark that even pantheism finds not a justification of itself, but a fulfillment greater than itself in the Christian scheme. Man becomes divine not by a substantial fusion with God entailing the annihilation of personality, but by a personal divinization through the union and identification which visions affect, the oneness of love and the knowledge which is intuition. Anima fit quodo modo omnia, said Aristotle. The mind becomes, in a manner, all things. And St. Thomas was able to include in the all things the maker of them all. It is this process of divinization which ought to be begun by us on earth. The faculty of reason by which moral judgments are to be made ought now to be identified with God's mind. Since it is the mind of man supernaturally illumined, illumined indeed to such a degree that judgment becomes an intuitive rather than a rationation, the connatural judgment of the supernatural virtues the quasi-experimental knowledge and intuitive judgments of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, it becomes also a sort of determinism, not now to be avoided as an emptying of, civil, of humanity, but sought as a putting on of divinity, the free abandonment to the impulses of the Spirit of which John of St. Thomas so profoundly wrote. It is a kind of sublimated pragmatism, since the, in the last resort all things work together for good, for the good of man. It is a pragmatism purified and made absolute by faith in the divine goodness and by trust in the ultimate victory of absolute values. It is altruism indefinitely, infinitely enlarged and an altruism which there can be no shadow of conflict with self-interest, 
since the individual as a member of the body of Christ is working for his own perfection in working for that of the whole body, and vice versa. For this is the ideal in view, a society made perfect, fulfilled even to the fullness of the stature of Christ by the perfection of all its members. It is law in the great Thomist conception of law, not an external constraint, an arbitrary code, but an intrinsic order, making for beauty, for the splendor ordinance, as physical laws make for beauty and making for fulfillment precisely because freely realized in action. Let us note here another incorporation. It was part of the ethic of Shaftesbury and Hutchinson that the moral sense which concerns the rightness or wrongness of actions is a kind of aesthetic sense, a sort of good taste. Virtue is a lovely form, as Hutchinson expressed it. The good life is the aesthetically unexceptionable life. As it stands, this theory would, of course, be glaringly inadequate. To make morality merely a matter of good taste is to empty it of most of its content and to invite degradation into the conventional formalism of the standards of what is not done. Yet it enshrines a great truth. For St. Thomas, too, goodness is beauty although his definitions are greater and deeper, and the fulfillment of the law is the pursuit of beauty. Christianity is not one of the creeds that refuse and restrain. It advocates a continuous growth. It finds its peak in the doctrine of the pleroma, the fullness of the body of Christ. St. Thomas can incorporate hedonism because he gives happiness a new meaning. He can unite eudaimonism and deontology because the essence of both is charity. The comprehensive richness of the Thomist worldview thus appears in ethics as in metaphysics, and it is no longer merely a grand ideal, as the purely philosophical scheme would appear to be. It is thorough, thoroughly practical. It is applicable to every act. Conscience combines in itself the various norms. It is reason and intuition. It is an index to God's will. It is a participation of the eternal law. We need not be afraid to discuss right conduct in terms of eudaimonism, or of altruism if we do not neglect deontology. The right action will be consonant with all. It cannot be until we are beginning to achieve synthesis within our lives that we can hope to bring about synthesis without. We must be trying to be whole before we attempt to make whole. There is urgent need of synthesis. There is equal urgent need of a true teleology. In one current of Catholic thought, meaning by that phrase the thought of Catholics, a marked change is apparent after the time of the Council of Trent. St. Thomas's synthesis can be said in general terms to have consisted in a fusion of the Platonist and Aristotelian with the Stoic tradition of ethical thought. The search for the realization within the personality of the good and obedience to an extrinsic right, a code. Other Catholic thinkers often follow more exclusively the Stoic tradition, partly because their teaching was of necessity concerned with commandments and counsels, or with the correction of abuses. Yet even so, there was always present the idea of the good and of finality, the vision of God. But a trend of post-Tridentine thought has been in a new manner legalist. St. Thomas himself 
has been presented in legalist dress. The triumph of law in the 13th century would seem to have had its influence on the history of subsequent thought. Magister Manerius, who had been one of Abelard's favorite pupils, cried one day with the voice of prophecy in the schools, Woe to the day when law shall kill the study of letters. And Geraldus Cambrensis, who heard him, saw it fulfilled. But literature was not only sufferer. Law, either civil or canon, has become the scientia lucrativa. It is the lawyers to whom the key of the well is given, says Girard, Chancellor of the University in 1238. A young man goes to theology for two years and gives it up for law, and is made an archdeacon. And though the more devout questioned as to whether the archdeacon could be saved, a good many were prepared to risk it. One is tempted to see a connection between this victory and the legalist theology of a latter age. However, that may be the legalist theory is certainly very far removed from the spirit of St. Thomas. It regards moral theology, as Perry Tumner pointed out in an article on the subject, as essentially concerned with the study, interpretation, and explanation of divine and classical laws. And the same writer continues, We must say frankly that every ounce of Christian instinct urges us to react against such a conception of moral theology and of the Christian life. Admittedly, this conception has been all too prevalent in the contemporary theological literature. Yet it is entirely alien to the traditional standpoint and the authentic Catholic theology of the masters of the Middle Ages. It is a matter for thankfulness that the Christian instinct and realism of the younger generation of present-day Catholics is increasingly in revolt against this. The day is surely past for the moral systems of the legalists whose whole effort was directed to precise delineation of the boundaries between what is allowed and what is forbidden. St. Thomas Aquinas viewed things very differently. It was St. Thomas who wrote the beautiful passage, That which is foremost in the law of the New Testament, and that in which all its power and strength consists, is the grace of the Holy Spirit, which is given by faith in Christ. Thus the new law itself is first and foremost the grace of the Holy Ghost, which is given to believers in Christ. And St. Thomas has a magnificent conclusion to the article from which we have quoted. He tells us that whereas the law of Moses was essentially a written law, that is to say, a positive law externally imposed. The, the new law of Christ is above all a law, a law inscribed by the indwelling of the Holy Ghost in very hearts of men in a state of grace, a living law which moves men and impels them forward to God their last end. So the teaching of St. Catherine of Geno- Genoa expounded by von Hugel in his mystical element of religion, emphasizes the fact that holiness consists primarily not in the absence of faults, but in the presence of spiritual force, in love creative, love triumphant. The soul becomes flame rather than snow, and dwelling upon what to do, give and be, rather than upon what to shun. And a German theologian, Dr. Pieper, in his article Über das Christic Menschenbild, urges the importance of recovering and reaffirming the pre-Tridentin point of view. The opening sentence of St. Thomas's moral theology expresses a truth which we Christians today have an almost entirely forgotten, 
the truth that moral deals first and foremost with man, that its task is to explain what man should be like, the ideal of man, and that consequently Christian morals should portray the Christian ideal of man. In medieval Christianity, this truth was taken for granted, but it soon came to be overlooked, and already, two generations after St. Thomas, Eckhart had to remind his contemporaries that people should not concern themselves so much with what they should do, but rather with what they should be. Later on, owing to a variety of causes, Moral theology came to lose sight of this view of things altogether. So much so that even those textbooks which claimed to be ad mentem sancti tome differed from him on this fundamental point. This is one reason why it scarcely occurs to the average Christian of today to look to moral theology or philosophy for information regarding the true being or ideal of man. Rather, we do associate with morals an exposition of what we are to do, still more what we are not to do, a codification of commandments and still more of prohibitions. Naturally, moral theology treats also of doing and not doing, of obligations commandments, sins, but its primary proper concern on which all the uh, rest depends, it is the true being of man, the portrayal of the good man. And he concludes, it is, I think, a not unimportant concern to restore this sublime ideal of classical theology to the consciousness of our age. Not because of historical sentimentality, but because this view is still valid. And not only valid, but because it is, I believe, a matter of life and death for us to recover and reaffirm it. De Estes I said, ye are gods. If deontology, for all its grandeur, is arid, legalism is suicidal and petty at once. As divination of the end of the Thomas scheme, so it is the keynote of the way towards the end. The gaiety of the man in whom there is neither self-destruction nor crushing legalism nor the pettiness of pharisaic formalism, but the wholeness of purpose of an integral personality. We have to beware in our world that conventional morality, the vernacular of scientific legalism, which is so diametrically opposed to teleology, to the recognition of the necessity for realizing in the self the idea of the beautiful and the good, How far are civilization forgetting the gospel, the good news, the redemption of fallen human nature into a new divine adoption seems sometimes to have fallen, not only from divine splendor of the Christian ideal, but even from the natural grandeur of the revelationless Greeks. What would they, at their best, Think of our industrial slums, our suburbs, of many of our conventions, of our bureaucratic or totalitarian despotisms, our social vanities, our commercial squalors. They at least worship beauty, and it is in the secret of blazing clarity of their culture that they worshipped it in deed and in truth, as a divinity to be put on as far as was possible transforming flesh and blood into poetry and rhythm, transfiguring the soul with light. Have we not, in effect, lost this conception? A fundamental forgetfulness of the meaning of Christianity, of the idea of personality and the idea of growth in love, would seem to be the root cause, and the danger for the Christian in such a 
atmosphere is that religion for him may be too mechanicized and life discontinuous, broken up into unrelated fragments, that morals may assume a legalist dress, an emphasis upon a code in which conduct is to be confined, with, in consequence, a self-complacent conviction of a yawning hell waiting for those who do not keep the rules. There is a depth of theology in the line of the copa. A perit cui sunt prisca supercilia. Let him be destroyed whose eyebrows are upraised. The satisfied judge is so often in worse case than sinner, for it is bad to go through life selling one's birthright for a mess of pottage. It is worse not to realize that one has a birthright. We may spend our time making howlers in our lives at school. We spend our time making howlers in our Latin but at least we should avoid in our outlook and intentions the legalist fallacy. To keep religion in a pigeonhole and let the rest of life look after itself in isolation, it is not to live but to disintegrate. Having recognized the end, we have to build up the whole personality towards it, The need for a true teleology and need for synthesis coincide. This is, in fact, the ultimate synthesis which the principles of Christianity can achieve, the union of theocentricity with humanism. The greatness of Greece is not lost, while its substantial imperfections are remedied. To wish to separate Christianity from everything human, and consequently from humanism, says Pere Charmant, is to fail to realize that one is taking from the Church her proper characteristic of Catholicity. It is to turn Christianity into a sect. One has to wait for the Reformation, writes Gilson, to find the naturalism of the ancients rejected as irreconcilable with Christianity. It may be felt that all teleological systems of ethics and of humanism appear, perhaps in particular, that they are magnificent while fortune smiles, but sadly out of tune in their optimism with a life too full of troubles and sorrows. However, we might ask, can we set about this glorious pursuit of a glorious end when life is a day-to-day struggle, and one is miserable and stupid and weak? How, still more, when one's world is weighted down with evil and misery and darkened by fear of total extinction? It is here that St. Thomas, the theologian, has an answer. He can appeal to the doctrine of the mystical body of Christ, a common life, flowing from a common source, strengthening all members alike in given giving the smallest and most fruitless striving and the greatest, most desperate misery a meaning as functionality, organically helping towards the fulfillment of the body as a whole. To see a religion as a mode of living, the whole of one's life, to see God's laws as the pattern of a duty which gives human nature its fullest glory, to see morality as the positive realization at once of personal personality, function, experience, and worship into the possession, in a perfected self and a perfective society, of that love, which in St. Thomas's words is the ultimum intentum, the final aim, of the eternal law. This is the core of the Thomist system. But there is one further and deeper difficulty. The doctrine of the mystic body, it may be said, can perhaps offer some consolation to the man whom the outward circumstances would otherwise have made hopeless, though it is at best cold comfort, but it does 
nothing to answer the practical difficulty inherent in the theory itself, the failure to which all experience seems to point. Who, it will be argued, has ever achieved such a synthesis? And if nobody, then is not self-condemned. On paper it may seem to represent Christianity, but look at the Christians. Montesquieu's wicked troglodytes were scarcely in greater confusion and perhaps were, if anything, less paltry. The result of the Christian's cult of purity, a mixture of fear and prurience of his charity, sentimentality outside business hours, of his attitude towards the body, an agglomerate of irrational taboos, of his attitude to the mind, a timid circumscription. We might well reply to this that to base one's judgment on the behavior of individual Christians is unfair. We all, more or less, fail to live up to our principles, and, has not already been remarked, grace normally speaking cannot fully function where a nature fails to play its part, and we have, most of us, for a variety of causes, a noticeable deficiency on the natural side. But this reply will hardly do. We should expect the Christian saints, at least, a faithful realization of the ideal. This is surely what the sanctity implies. Yet do not the saints often seem to be far from the ideal of wholeness? Does it not seem to be the frequent testimony of experience that Christianity itself is often such as to make the carrying out of a humanist program impossible, in the sense that the Christian finds his religion forever blocking his way, forbidding him this and that, cutting across ambitions however congruous to his natural capacities, affections, however fine? We are nearer to a true answer when we remind ourselves once again that humanism is not self-expressionism, the actualization of the potential in us does not mean striving after perfection in every conceivable aspect of life. The whole Smith is not the same as the whole Robinson, for the potential Smith is not the same as the potential Robinson. It is not possible to be even fairly good at everything, and the result of trying is dilettantism, not humanism. Each of us has his own particular line, more or less clearly defined by his own potentialities. Each has a subsidiary capacities in other directions. Nobody has capacities in all directions. The difference between Christian humanism and Manichaeism is not that the former forbids us to strike out in every direction while the latter would have us concentrate on one, but that the former urges the achievement of union with God through a unified perfection of the personal personality ind indicated to each individual by his own particular powers, while the latter regards the personality, or at least a part of the personality, as something to be ignored and, if necessary, destroyed. There are men who have concentrated all their abilities and devoted all their time to the achievement of some great objective, the very nature of which forbids any tearing over lesser interests, and these are fulfilling their own particular possibilities precisely because his exclusive concentration. And we do not call them half men, we call them great men, because they have achieved something great and fulfilled themselves in the ch achieving. And why should we deny to the mystic what we so readily grant to these? That it should be so in perhaps the ultimate proof of the power of matter, the depth of the warfare between the spirit and the flesh, a man must follow his star. We do not grudge that it, men, 
should have left the wife and children in lands and reason for the flick of a needle on a speedometer, or a still life of a pair of shoes. The only field of research in which a man may make no sacrifices under pain being called a fanatic is God. Such men may become stunted, may become half-men, the academic philosopher who becomes a bookworm and no man, the businessman who becomes a commerce machine, the lawyer who becomes a codex. These fail, but it is not because their specialization has led them to adopt this line rather than another, but because their concentration on this has excluded, unnecessarily, all interest in the value of any other. The man who devotes his life to the advance of medical science cannot be a first-rate musician. He can appreciate the value of music. There is such a thing as an ascetic whose values good wine. Indeed, he is only ascetic, for the man who abstains does not value its ascetic, but, as St. Thomas would say, an agrestus, a bumpkin. Human demands not that a man should be everything, but that he should have his eyes and his heart open to the beauty of everything. And if Christianity commands this thing, and one remains poor, that thing and one remain celibate, and another and one submits one's will to authority, this does not mean that the valuing of the good things of life is precluded or that the personality is stunted. Self-sacrifice, has often been pointed out, is self-fulfillment. We dislike control. Damn braces, said William Blake, but we know it's necessity. And the man whose principles hinder enrichment or marriage, or any one of the endless possible experiences and joys of life, may become stunted indeed, but need not, for these are reversals, and denials can open up and enrich the soul in a way impossible to placid progress and affirmation. A deep distress hath humanized my soul. Perry Charmot, in his Le Humanism, Et la humane has defined humanism in the narrower sense as a uni certaine de l'usere finesse dont on me voudrait pas ne pas souffrir. Christians may talk much of purity, charity, truth, and may turn these things into practice, into prurient fear, smug sentimentality, narrow-mindedness, for we are all worthless servants. Christianity does not. It sets purity before us as a positive ideal, that charity, that clarity, that shining out of form through manner, or perfect harmony of flesh and spirit, which is part of beauty. It shows us charity as the adherence to the will to love, to the good, and that energizing, expansive love of God and his creatures, which issues by inner impulsion in loving actions. It shows us truth as God himself reflected in his creatures, and so assuming a variety of forms, Obscured, perhaps, by error, but never wholly absent. The end and explanation of every quest, however, apparently misconceived. Christians have sometimes made negation their object. Christianity's aim is always affirmation.